Did you know that oral cancer is underdiagnosed? Every medical provider can impact positively on their patient's health by performing a simple exam. Welcome, I'm Dr. Gwen Cohen-Brown and I'm speaking to you from the Dental Hygiene Clinic in New York City College of Technology. Today we're going to review the proper way to do a head and neck exam and the rationale for doing so for your patients. This video is presented by the New York, New Jersey AIDS Education and Training Center, Oral Health Regional Resource Center, and New York City College of Technology. In order to do a proper head and neck exam, one of the things that's the most important is to remember to do it in the same sequence every single time so that you don't leave out a step and forget to examine a certain part of the area. When I start, I tend to start from behind the patient and I'm going to explore the occipital nodes. Occasionally, you want to have the patient put their head back a little bit so that the skin isn't so tight and you can actually get under there to feel where the nodes are. If you have an enlargement here in this area, one of the things you certainly can think about are things like mononucleosis. Following that, I'm going to take the patient's head and gently turn it like this so that I'm releasing the sternocleidomastoid muscle and now I can get my hands around it. The most superior part of the anterior cervical chain is right here, and when you have anything draining intraorally, you're gonna start getting some enlargements of these lymph nodes in this area. Now, you can look at the posterior lymph node when it's released like this as well, but it's often easier to do it on the patient on the other side. After you do that, you turn the patient around and you do exactly the same thing I like hear, where I'm releasing the muscle on the left side and then examining the posterior part of the cervical chain over on this side. After this, I'm going to have the patient swallow, make sure everything is mobile, and then I go to the posterior part of the angle of the mandible, work my fingers down towards the eight apices of the um, front of the mandible, somewhat underneath and here as well, just to make sure things are mobile, and I'm going to wind up at the joint. Please open. There are two ways, at least, of taking care of the assessment of the joint. I prefer to have my fingers behind the patient's opening joint, and that way I can feel what happens very clearly when the patient is opening and closing. Open and close, please. The other way of assessment, you can put your hands here, but what you're really feeling is changes in the muscle, not so much on the joint itself. Following this, I'm going to go around the patient and do a similar assessment from the front. Again, I'm gonna ask the patient to open and close, and close, and one of the things you look for is deviation, any crepitus, which is what the, the terminology is for um, crunchy sounds that you hear in the joint, and essentially, if you do not have pain, there's no reason, even if you have crunching, to go in and have anything done to change your occlusion, to change your bite, even a night guard might not be necessary. Following that, I'm gonna go back down on the mandible, have the patient bite down really hard, feel the master muscle, go forward, and then we're gonna start the intraoral component of the intraoral exam. You want to make sure you're doing everything exactly the same way every single time so you don't forget anything. And what we have here is the lips. On the bottom of the lip, inside the cheeks, what you have are minor salivary gland lobules, and you have around 700 to 1,000 minor salivary gland lobules, and any of them can be obstructed or broken or collapsed, so it is not an uncommon thing to see at all. Bite down, please. You can look at the teeth, make sure everything looks healthy, that there's nothing obvious decay, that the patient isn't missing any teeth, and then you're gonna put your fingers in the vestibule and make sure everything feels smooth as well. Open, please. Following that, you're gonna palpate the floor of the mouth. And the way you palpate the floor of the mouth is called by manual palpation because you're pushing up against something. If you were not pushing up against your fingers, you would not have a very good sense of what you're feeling because you're pushing through and it's all soft tissue down here. At this point, I'm going to go get some gauze and 
a tongue compressor. Have the patient open, tilt your head up a little bit and say, ah, ah, thank you. I'm going to look at the pharyngeal walls. I'm going to look at the faucial pillars. I wanna make sure the uvula is moving. Following this, please take your tongue out. I'm going to wrap the tip of the tongue in gauze and I'm going to look at the posterior part of the tongue, the base of the tongue, where it meets the floor of the mouth. This is the most likely place for patients to develop cancer. And unfortunately, because of the location, they tend to be diagnosed at very late stages. Thank you very much, and this is the proper way to conduct a head neck exam. While assessing the extraoral component of the head and neck exam, there are some common lesions that you might see in the parotid gland, including this, which is a parotid gland tumor, a benign salivary gland tumor. However, bilateral parotid gland swelling are also seen in HIV patients, in patients with Sjogren's syndrome, and patients who are alcoholics. When evaluating the lips, there are two conditions that we see frequently. The first is called angular chylitis, and it occurs on the commissures of the lips, and it tends to be seen with a little bit of bleeding, some cracking, and fissuring. When patients present with angular chylitis, regardless of how they have it, why it developed, it is always due to yeast infections and should be treated with antifungal medications. The second condition we see often on the lips is herpes labialis, otherwise known as cold sores or fever blisters. These occur in 40 to 60% of the population, and it is likely that you will see patients with these. They can be treated topically with acyclovir or pencyclovir or denivir. When evaluating the buccal mucosa, one of the most likely lesions you will see is a fibroma, a benign reactive lesion, usually secondary to trauma. If it gets infected or irritated, it should be removed. When evaluating the gingiva, there are many lesions you may find, including this one, acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis, which used to be known as trench mouth. Other conditions that are also seen on the gingiva include disquamative gingivitis, or peeling of the gingiva, and a secondary herpetic lesion, which occurs on the attached mucosa and the palate. Moving from the gingiva to the dentition, in a healthy adult, you should see 32 erupted teeth. In addition, you can look for abnormalities on the tooth structure itself, including decay, restorations, or erosions, as you see here in this picture. Erosions of this type can occur in patients who are bulimic, have a high acid content in their diet, or have GI reflux. One of the most common conditions we see on the tongue is known as geographic tongue, it is seen frequently with fissured tongue. Neither geographic tongue or fissured tongue needs to be treated. Patients just need to be reassured that this is within normal limits. Patients often present with aphthous ulcers. Minor aphthous are under one centimeter, will heal on their own, and in general are more of a nuisance. Major aphthous ulcers are larger than one centimeter occasionally will take weeks to resolve and often need to have treatment in order for it to go away completely. Aphthous ulcers of both type only occur on movable mucosa, including the tongue, the lips, the cheek, and pore of mouth. Hairy tongue is another common oral lesion that we frequently see. In this case, the patient has a history of tobacco use and caffeine use, which has turned the color brown. In most cases, the color will represent what the patient has been eating or drinking. Moving on to the hard and soft palate, this patient is presenting with an acute atrophic and pseudomembranous candidiasis, frequently seen in patients using asthma inhalers who are not directing the mist into their lungs. This patient is presenting with a denture stomatitis. It is important to remember to remove your patient's dentures while doing an intraoral exam. Denture stomatitis occurs immediately below the denture base and the tissue appears red and swollen. It is quite uncomfortable as well. Often, patients will present with a papillary component of the denture stomatitis and when they do, it is referred to as papillary hyperplasia of the palate. 
Thank you for watching this video. We hope you find the information helpful and you implement it in your practice. On behalf of the New York, New Jersey AIDS Education Training Center and New York City College of Technology, we thank you for watching.